God yelled at me in church, and he said, what are you doing here? I said, it's Tuesday night, I'm going to church. It's what I always do on Tuesday night. And you know what he said? I do not need you sitting there anymore staring at that man. I have got something for you to do, and I want you to get out of here and go do it. I'm going to use an analogy. I used it a little bit last night, but I'm going to use it a lot more tonight and even more tomorrow about pregnancy. Now, I know that men don't get to have babies, but you surely have watched the process enough that you get a general idea of what's going on. And so to speak, we need to be pregnant in the spirit. See, so this is a time when men can get pregnant. Because we need to be pregnant in the spirit with the dreams and the visions and the hopes and the ideas that God puts on the inside of us. I actually believe, according to 1 John 3, 9, that every person who is a born-again believer is pregnant with everything that God is. His seed is planted in the womb of our spirit at the new birth. So I believe that a seed of everything that God is comes to us. We're made new creatures. We have a brand new opportunity. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. But a woman cannot become pregnant until she first conceives. You have to be able to conceive. And the Bible says that by faith, Sarah conceived and delivered a child. So you can conceive a dream for your life. And that word means to become pregnant with, to form in your mind, to think or to imagine. But now, in order to conceive, I think you have to understand that everybody is on a level playing ground. I think that some people just discount themselves because of what side of the tracks they were born on or how much education they have or, you know, even what color their skin is or, you know, what kind of family they grew up in or how they were treated growing up. It's amazing how people will just say, well, you know, I, I'm glad that that's, I believe that God can do that, but I just don't think that he'll ever do it for me. I remember after being abused sexually by my father for so many years, and anybody that's abused in any way, it affects you the same way, but I was abused emotionally not so much physically occasionally, but I watched my mother get a lot of physical abuse, but repeated sexual abuse. Well, I just made an agreement with the lie that the devil told me that I would always have a second-rate life. Do you know that Satan will tell you lies, but it's amazing how many times every day he comes and whispers some lie to us, and we just make an agreement with him. We make an agreement with those lies. And so you have to learn how to break agreements. You have to learn how to listen to the lies of Satan and break those agreements. And so I just assumed that I would always have a, a second-rate life, maybe an okay life, but a second-rate life. So I really wasn't able to conceive. I couldn't give birth to anything if I couldn't conceive. And I wasn't able to see that with God, all things are equal. The first scripture I'd like us to look at is Colossians chapter 3. Verse 11, and it basically lets us know that in Christ we're all playing on a level playing field. This is a beautiful scripture, Colossians 3, 11. In this new creation, which is being recreated in Christ, now watch this, all distinctions vanish. Wow. That means the preacher is no different than whoever's going to stick around and clean up the building when the meeting's over. All distinctions vanish. There's no room and neither can there be. Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. One scripture says male nor female. <laughs> nor difference between nations, whether alien, barbarians, or sentients, who are the most savage of all. Nor slave or free men, but Christ is all and in all, everything and everywhere to all men without distinction of person. Isn't that beautiful? So no matter what happened to you in the past, the moment that you receive Christ as your Savior, everybody is on a level playing field. And the promises of God are for whosoever will. Whosoever will, number one, believe them, and whosoever will, number two, learn the principles of God that must be applied to your life in order to see these promises come to pass. 
You are a partner with God. You have a part and God has a part. You cannot do his part and he will not do your part. And what I just said is extremely important, so I'm going to say it again. You are partners with God. That means that you have a part and God has a part. You cannot do God's part. And God will not do your part. Amen? So there are principles that we have to learn. There are things that we have to learn. So dreaming is good. You need to be able to conceive a dream and a vision for your life. But what if you've got a dream, you've got a vision, you've got an idea, you're praying, you're going to church, you got everybody's CD library and DVD library, you've read the books, you've bought the t-shirt, you've done it all. And you've been believing God for a while. And you would just say tonight, well, you know, Joyce, nothing is changing. <laughs> nothing really is happening. Now, first of all, let me say, just because you don't see anything happening or you don't feel anything happening, that really doesn't mean that nothing's happening. Because one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is what I call the silent years or the dormant season in our life. In St. Louis, the leaves are all starting to fall off the trees and... Dave and I marvel every year that a tree that was so lush and beautiful just a few weeks ago, in just a few more weeks, will just look like a dead stick. But the interesting thing, if you know a little bit about trees, which a little bit is all I know, but I know enough to get a good lesson out of it, that while that tree looks so dead, there's sap that's gathering up on the inside, getting it ready for spring growth. So you may look quite dead, feel quite dead. You may look to everybody like there's just zero zippo going on in your life. But that does not mean that God is not doing an awesome thing on the inside of you. Amen? So what's wrong if I've had this dream and vision for a long time, and you can even say I'm tired of hearing people, preachers come in and talk about have a dream, have a vision, I've got a dream, I've got a vision, but nothing is happening. <laughs> Amen? Well, the first thing I want you to ask yourself is does your goal, your dream, your vision agree with God's Word? Now, I'm not going to try to get overly spiritual here, but the bottom line is, is we know that God is not going to help us do something that's not His will. <laughs> At least we better hope He doesn't. Amen? And so, it's not just a matter of us getting some kind of a, a dream, but it has to be something that God's Word can agree with. I don't necessarily think that what your goals and dreams are have to be something that you get through a prophecy or a trumpet blast or an angelic appearance. I think it can feel quite natural to you, but it has to agree with God's Word. See, I know that for me to say, well, I've got a dream to feed a million children a day, I know that's okay. God can get on board with that because the Bible already says that He wants us to bring justice. Now, will I ever reach that? I don't know. But I've got to have something to reach for. I can't be static. And I would rather dream a big dream and get part of it than to dream a little dream and get all of it. <laughs> Amen? So make sure that your dream agrees with God. Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh. But he went the exact opposite direction. And he went to Tarshish. You know, sometimes we're going the exact opposite direction that God wants us to go in. And we just don't get it because it's the direction we want to go in. We keep trying to get God to get on board with us, and he's on some other ship going in another direction. <laughs> and if you look at Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. It's pretty plain, isn't it? That great city and proclaim against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God wanted him to go and confront this sinful nation. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from being in the presence of the Lord as his prophet. Why? He was afraid. He didn't want the responsibility. He didn't want the judgment, the criticism. Who knows? Maybe he didn't like the weather where God was sending him. 
But he went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish, the most remote of the Phoenician trading places then known. So he paid the appointed fare and went down into the ship to go with them to Tarshish from being in the presence of the Lord as his servant and minister. But the Lord sent out a great wind upon the sea and there was a violent tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken. Can I just tell you that if you are on the wrong ship, you are going to have a rough ride? Amen? So you've got to make sure that you're on the right ship. You've got to make sure you're on the ship that, that God is on. And that doesn't mean that there won't be any trials and tribulations, but it does mean that you'll sense God's presence and you'll know that He's with you. The next thing I think that you have to make sure of, and this is something that I could probably just preach on the rest of the night, but I'm going to restrain myself from doing it. Hopefully you'll get it quick. The next thing I want to say is you may have a God goal. You may have a God-given goal, but still have an impure motive. Now, motives are so important. I'm just going to be honest with you and tell you, when God first called me to do this, I was not doing it because I had this deep desire to help people. I wanted to be somebody. <laughs> I had big problems from my past, but I didn't know that I still had them. I didn't know how pathetically insecure I was. And I didn't know how much I got my worth and value out of what I did. And I would venture to say that a large majority of people don't know themselves very well. Self-deception is the easiest thing to fall into, and it is the hardest thing in the world to face. Amen? And God cannot fulfill your goals and dreams, even though they're His goals and dreams, unless you let Him do a purifying work on the inside of you. And the way He does that is through His Word and through circumstances... The Word and the Holy Spirit press you from the inside. The circumstances press you from the outside. And somehow in the midst of all that, your flesh gets crushed. And you finally end up being usable material for God. And I went through all kinds of experiences. They're way too long to tell, but I'll just tell you one of them. I worked at a church in St. Louis for five years. I taught home Bible studies five years. I was faithful in that. One in my home, one in a friend's home. Had all kinds of financial needs, didn't make any money for doing that. And it was a real time of just learning how to trust God for everything. And um, then I went, I went to work at a church in St. Louis and worked there for five years and started what initially began as a women's meeting and went on one radio station eventually in St. Louis. But after five years, God began to deal with me that it was time for me to leave and go start my ministry. And it took me another year to get around to being obedient. And during that year, I became more and more miserable daily. I can tell you, if you're somewhere where God is no longer at, <laughs> for you, it is going to be tough. Now, there's an interesting thing about God that I hope that I can explain to you, but we all have hold of something in our life right now. You, you, you got a hold of something. But God is out there calling you to a, a new something because it's just the way he works. But he always keeps it about that far away from you. So there's no way that you can touch it or reach it or get to it unless you let go of what's back here. Because when he says, rely on me, lean on me, trust in me, he means it. And what we would like to do is keep this, get hold of this, try this out, look it over, see what we think. But we hate to be left with no options. 
And so when God told me, take your ministry, go north, south, east, and west, was exactly what he said to me. And I had prophecies. I mean, I had people coming into the church that I didn't even know prophesying to me. I had a little guy that was an intercessor that I'd never met before that was a member of a Methodist church in town that came to one of my meetings one night, and he's like talking to me about what God wants me to do. And he said, I've been praying for you for years, and God's going to do this, and God's going to do that. And I mean, it was so obvious that God wanted me to go that it was just pathetic. But I wouldn't go. And let me tell you something. When God's done, you might as well get done. Because no matter how hard that next step is, you are going to sit there and die inside. If you don't take that next step. Some of you are in jobs that you despise and hate. And it's no more what you are supposed to be doing or called to do. But you stay there because of the money. Well, I can tell you what you'll have. You'll be miserable your whole life, and you'll get bitter and resentful, and you'll blame everybody else. And what you should do is do what you know you were born to do. Do what you know you were created for, and trust God. And some of you are going like, oh, my God. <laughs> you didn't have to come here and talk right to me, did you? So, I liked that job I had. I mean, there was a part of me, obviously, a spiritual part of me that wanted to go. <laughs> I mean, because I, I wanted to write books. I wanted to do things. And, you know, my pastor and I had a talk, and he said, you know, Joyce, you're here to help me with this vision and, that I have. And, you know, I, we can't have two things going on here. So, you've either got to get fully on board or you're going to have to go do something else. Well, I knew that I was never, ever, ever going to be satisfied if I couldn't fulfill these other things in my heart. And way down deep inside, I knew that I knew that I knew, or at least I felt that I knew that God had called me to a broader spectrum of teaching. And uh, so finally, you know, I got so miserable that I didn't have any choice but to go. But, you know, I, I had security there. Somebody else believed for my paycheck every week. And I was somebody. I was important. I was like the church pillar I had my little group of people who followed me around everywhere that I went. I had my little ladies meeting on Thursday, and I preached when the pastor was gone, and I taught in Bible school, and I had a front row seat and a parking place with my name on it. I mean, how much better does it get? Well, see, the sad thing was, was back then, all of that made me feel important. And I didn't even know it until God finally kicked me out of the nest you know, the mother eagle, if the eaglets won't fly, she will start pulling all the padding out of the nest until they're sitting on nothing but thorns. <laughs> this is true. She pads the nest with feathers and newspapers and all kinds of branches and soft stuff, but it comes time for them to fly, she starts taking it out. And then eventually, if they won't go, she'll just pick them up, take them up in the air, and drop them. <laughs> so God started pulling the padding out of my nest, and... Finally, one night in church, he yelled at me. God yelled at me in church, and he said, what are you doing here? I said, it's Tuesday night. I'm going to church. It's what I always do on Tuesday night. And you know what he said? I do not need you sitting there anymore staring at that man. I have got something for you to do, and I want you to get out of here and go do it. <laughs> now, please understand, God said this to me. I didn't say it to myself. And you may be in the same church your whole entire life, and I think that's admirable and great. Faithfulness is a beautiful quality. There's too much church hopping and jumping all over the place and no commitment and no faithfulness. But whatever it is that God's calling you to do, let's just set aside the whole ministry thing for a minute because I definitely don't want to make this just like a ministry thing because I know for a big majority of you, you probably don't even feel like that applies. But how many of you do want to do something for God? Whether you do it in the secular arena where you're at, you know, like, like Paul he not only is a minister here, but he's using his medical skills to help people. God wants all of us to use the skills that we have to help people. So many people in the body of Christ are just are called in the ministry of helps. What a wonderful calling that is. And yet we, we minimize it. We let Satan minimize it by saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a helper. 
Let me tell you something. I would die if I didn't have people helping me. I mean, some of the most valuable people in my life are the people that do the things behind the scenes. Nobody may ever know their name, but let me tell you something. I could not be doing what I'm doing if I did not have those people. Or somebody says, well, you know, I'm just a stay-at-home mom. You know, you let, you let that spirit of diminishment come on you. Satan brings a spirit of diminishment, and he wants to diminish and shrink everything that you do and make you feel little and small and worthless. And I'm here to tell you that in Christ, all distinctions vanish, and you're not, you're not just in anything. But at that particular time, I didn't know it, but I was getting a lot of my worth and value out of that position because I came out of that abusive situation feeling like I had no value. I was worthless. I'd never been loved properly. I'd been abused and mistreated and rejected and abandoned. And I was just such a mess, but didn't even really know I was a mess. I thought everybody else had a problem. I didn't realize it was me. Can anybody in the building relate? Well, if not, you may get it before I let you out of here tonight. It's just possible that your unhappiness is your own fault. Come on now, don't look at me like that. I always thought I was unhappy because Dave, 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 Dave did, Dave didn't, Dave didn't, Dave did. Until God told me one day when I was praying for Dave to change, Dave is not the problem. And I was totally shocked. I thought, well, who is? There's only me and him. <laughs> okay, so God told me to take this ministry, go north, south, east, and west. And I finally, after being so miserable I couldn't hardly stand it, I finally obeyed him and, and went to north St. Louis, east St. Louis, west St. Louis, and south St. Louis. Because that was, I mean, nobody knew me anywhere, so where am I going to go? That's the funny thing. You know, it's like when God told Abraham, go. Pack up your tent and go to the place that I will show you. Well, I had to let go of everything that I knew that was security to me and just get out there and go, now what? Oh, it was some of the scariest times in my life. But then when I would go to church on Sunday, this is when I began to realize what a problem I had. When I would go to church on Sunday and I was no longer who I used to be in that church, I felt so insecure and out of place, and I didn't know what was going on anymore, and that bothered me. And I didn't have my own special seat anymore, and that bothered me. And I just had to go park like everybody else. I didn't have my own parking place anymore. And, and I know that probably sounds stupid, but I hope you get the spirit of what I'm trying to say. I was getting my worth and value out of that. I would drive on the parking lot and go, oh, Joyce Meyer. <laughs> go to the front row. Oh. Joyce Meyer. <laughs> so I'm just telling you the truth. In the beginning days, it was a God dream that I had, and it wasn't that my heart was totally rotten because it wasn't. I mean, yes, I wanted to help people, but I had problems in my soul that needed to be dealt with. And so the whole reason, now come on, stick with me, the whole reason why these things that we want to happen are not birthed overnight, the whole reason why we have to be pregnant a long time is because there's a whole lot of stuff that has to get ready on the inside of us before we even come close to being ready to give birth. Amen? And I will just say it to you like this. I think that most people never wait to come to full term. They either abort, they have a spiritual abortion and throw away their dream and vision, or they try to induce labor early. <laughs> Come on, is anybody with me? I mean, I stayed pregnant with one of my kids so long. Lord have mercy. I carried all my kids, every one of them. The shortest amount of time that I ever went over my due date was three and a half weeks. One five, one five and a half, one four and a half. My doctor finally said, you're the only human I know that stays pregnant as long as an elephant. Well, today we've talked about the silent years, and I'm sure that many of you think you're in the midst of them right now. And that's a time in your life when you have something in your heart that you really believe 
is going to happen, something that maybe you believe God wants you to do or something you believe that you're supposed to do, a goal, a dream, a vision, but it's not happening yet. And those can be really, really frustrating times. But, you know, just because God wants to do something with you doesn't mean that there's nothing for him to do in you. I always like to say that before God can do something through you, he has to do something to you. At least that was my experience. So I want to encourage you, take time to grow, to develop godly character, and listen to God. You know, the top of the mountain is not where you grow. We all like that place. But where we really grow is in the valley. We always grow when we choose to do the right thing when it doesn't feel good yet. And in the midst of waiting on God, have a really expectant attitude. And just expect God to move suddenly. Every day you can get up and say, something good is going to happen to me today. Why don't you try that and just see how much better you feel. Tomorrow when you get up, don't even wait till tomorrow. Just say it as soon as this program's over. Why don't you say it five times today? Something good is going to happen to me. Women in Albania are taught to be silent and not to speak out. This is something that has come from long past ago. And although many organizations uh, do advocate and do encourage women to bring it out and to um, tell the truth, it's something that has to do with the culture. If something happens to you, it's a shame factor. For some women, the Christian church is becoming a refuge, a place where they can speak freely. However, less than 2% of the population are Christian, and most of them have no spiritual mothers or fathers. What I'm facing, I cannot share with my parents. They are not Christians. What I'm facing, I cannot, I do not have an adult Christian to talk to and say, is this normal, what is happening to me? Or how can I face this difficulty? Counsel is something that we lack. The first generation has just to experience everything, good or bad. And this spiritual mother for people, it's for, for the ladies and for the women, it's very important because it's somebody saying, I've gone through this way. It's painful, but you're going to make it. And this is what Joyce has been transmitting to us and giving us power to go forward. Even though there are hard times in our life, even though not everything is perfect, but we know that somebody else went through the same road, the same pain, and she made it. So we're going to make it as well. Iedere dag worden we door vele stemmen, gedachten en meningen overspoeld. Hoe kunnen we erachter komen wat God ons door bepaalde levensvragen en dagelijkse uitdagingen zeggen wil? Joyce Meyer legt in dit boek uit op welke verschillende manieren God met je kan communiceren. Bestel nu hoe je Gods stem kunt horen telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.